I think this is my first uh, YouTube live stream. I got to figure out how to make this chat bigger. Pop out chat. That's what I need. Good evening. How you doing? It's really funny because I stream on Twitch five days a week and it's just like, I don't know, it's second nature. But uh, whenever I stream on Facebook or YouTube, I get really nervous. I don't know what the deal is. And then there's, of course, dog hair on my microphone. Don't ask how that happens. Unless you own a dog and then you know that it's everywhere. So, um, Dean Paul, what's good? Andy, how you doing? Um, a couple, a couple housekeeping events. First and foremost is I need to share this, um, this session with you. Let me make sure that everybody has the link. Beginners tutorial 2.0, copy Dropbox link. I'll put that in the chat right there. Augustine, how you doing? Um, and then also, I will pull up the the Discord server and we can do a uh, beginner's tutorial live stream type uh, question and answer if if that would be helpful for people. So we'll just keep it as an option and I'll give it a couple of minutes for people to to get in here. Is everybody able to access that file? That's the important one. So we'll test that out. Yep, that should work. We should be fine on that. All right. All right. So uh, does anybody have any questions from the first session? Anything that, that was over your head? It was pretty, pretty basic. Ah, no, it shouldn't be a MP4. Should be, um, No. Did I post the wrong link already? Man, oh man. Oh, nope, 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 nope. We got to take that. Uh, we got to take that down. Yeah, that one was that was what was going up on YouTube. Don't worry about that, but you can view that on YouTube. Yeah. I meant to send this. That's much better. Yeah. 
Glad it wasn't some some top secret video or something. But yeah, that I just uploaded to YouTube. So you'll be able to see that. And then you should be able to pull that up. And this will be the session that we're working on together. Any questions? Any questions about the the last stream or any of the things that we worked on? Anything that you got confused by? Let me know on that. And then I'll switch over. I'll be switching over to the other camera angle real quick. There we go. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. There we go. Remove the comment. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. So, just a little bit of a, just a little refresher of what we were doing. Um, we had super basic loop here. This was from Deep Child from the sample pack, which is also available if you go to my link tree. There's a sample pack available with all kinds of friends and colleagues that, that were generous enough to put together a sample pack. And yeah, yeah. Then we will, I'll just give you a little refresher on this. So Deep Child, Very basic, uh, but amazing chord stab, or stab. Now, I added some delay on there. That's what it sounds like with, with no reverb, no delay. I will actually back off the reverb, because it already has kind of its own reverb on there. Simple Sam. This is the same sample pack. Ah, uh, now people are coming out with the Twitch usernames. Nice. Okay. And then, if you remember, this is just a pitched... A pitch sound of the exact same sample. I think we pitched it up uh, a full octave. Super simple drum rack from the 909 core kit which is included in everybody's Ableton suite that they were able to download the demo version if they wanted to all right simple Sam it's funny you're uh, you're you're very much a multi-stream viewer that would, that would be too chaotic for me. So just uh, just to review, we've got this, we've got the clap, and to review this, you can put effects inside within that drum sound. So this auto filter, for example, is only affecting that one, uh, the, the hand clap, right? But if I took this filter outside of that, then it's affecting everything, right? 909 never gets old. It's the uh, 909 is uh, oftentimes my duct tape solution for uh, if, I, if I've got a mix down 
that's approaching a deadline and needs to be done and I get into the studio and I say, wow, I haven't listened to this track in three months and this kick does not sound like what I remembered it being. 909 saves the day. Andy, um, just download the uh, download the Ableton 11 demo. I th- you should be able to download the Ableton 11 demo and run them in parallel. You shouldn't have to... I, I think I've still got Ableton 9 on this computer. Don't ask why. It wouldn't even work on this computer, but yeah. So, okay. Basic hi-hat nothing else and then we started to make just like a a really really simple bass riff right nothing complex I'm gonna, I took off a little bit of that dirt. I brought down this filter to about 160 on the on the operator. So just remember, the operator, the, the nice thing about the operator, and this is what I would encourage everybody to do, it's really nice for you to learn synthesis. Instead of starting from scratch and building up, what you can often do, and I'm gonna open up a new operator, Let's go to instruments, operator, drag it in there. Okay. Go in and just open up a preset. All right. So, and you're going to, one little thing that I want to say. On these presets, uh, I'm not sure how visible it is with the, on your end, but if you notice these little presets, they, they look just like a, a computer window or something but then sometimes this window has a split pane and what that the the distinction between those is is that this right here it's a single pane window that's just gonna be a preset of this synth so if I double click that then that's what we're gonna see it's just gonna be an operator instance but if we click on these it looks like a double pane window that's gonna be effects and different macros bundled in here. So if I double click that, then you're gonna see that. If you want to expand that, I just shrank it. Um, If you want to expand, then you click there and you can see all the different things, right? So this, click on this little window and then you can expand that, expand that, and expand that. So there's your, there's your chain. You've got the, the operator preset, and then you've got an EQ8 rolling off the low end, and then you've got a chorus effect. And when you go in to the presets on these uh, split pane presets, you're going to notice that some of these knobs, like this one, the, the filter frequency on the operator, you can't mess with it. Reason being is that is um, connected to a macro. And what macros are is, if you go here, then you're gonna see that it's mapped to this. So whenever I move this knob, this filter knob is moving. But a lot of times it'll be connected to other things. So if you click on map, you can see what everything is mapped to, right? So, Filter frequency, there's only one thing connected. It's just controlling the filter frequency. Resonance, same. But then uh, if you get the uh, chorus, for example, it's controlling both the the device on and the dry wet. So, yeah. Uh, Here, for example, when it's at zero with with the chorus then that means the device is off. And then once you turn it, it's going to turn it on and it's going to start affecting the dry wet. Reason being is that it saves processor. 
to to turn the device off when it's at zero because you're not using it anyway. If you keep it at if you keep it at zero on the dry wet, but you keep the device on, then you're just hogging processor. So it's just a little well built preset. But all that's to say, we're gonna go back to what we had and let's just go to the world skate pad first preset in the pad section and I got to turn on my push so I can play some notes I always forget to turn it back on after I've been using endless so you should have it here Let's power it off and power it back on. Maybe it'd help if I plugged it in too. All right. Now, if I go here. Now, the thing with the preset is, is just start once you load it up, just start turning stuff off. So I'm going to turn off oscillator D and just see if I can hear any difference. Not a huge difference, but if I turn off C, it's starting to change things. It loses a little bit of body because this is uh, these oscillators are pitched down half a step or half an octave rather. And now we just got a single oscillator running. And then you can turn off the LFO. Let's, let's keep it at the right percentage. Turn off the filter. And then it's starting to become really basic, right? Not much going on. So if you turn off, let's go to this. This is, here is where you can decide. Remember I said velocity is how hard you're hitting a note. In this case, with synthesizers, because it's not a physical instrument, you can, uh, you can say, okay, however hard I hit these pads, I want this behavior to be affected by something like this. So velocity in this case, you're saying... We're going to have it, uh, we're going to say how big of a variance it is with the velocity, with how hard we hit it. And you can make it like that, or you can make it inversely proportional. And it'll, depending on how hard you hit it, you can just play around with that. The velocity, you could also control a filter frequency. You could do all kinds of stuff. So... Yeah, that's just something that you can learn how a synthesis works by just going through a preset, turning off seg segments, messing around with segments and having them be like a standalone thing. So that's really loud. Change quite drastically by turning up the LFO. And you can see if you have it all the way up, obviously it's complete chaos. But if you give it just a little bit, it starts getting, you can start hearing it get that little bit of dissonance in it. Where the oscillators are starting to detune a little bit and all that stuff. And um, you can see, just look at everything that we have in here. It's been a little bit of time that since I've had it um, or since I've had this open. There's all kinds of different things that you can play around with. You can set the repeat. So when you want the, 
when you want things to repeat, uh, it, if you have something, for example, just hold over and it says uh, higher harmonics can be generated by repeating the uh, drawn partials with a gradual fade out based on the settings in the repeat chooser. Low repeat values result in a, higher, a brighter sound while higher repeat values result in a more high end roll off and a more prominent fundamental. So if you have any questions, like if you want to just see what this does, mouse over it and there's going to be a little information box that pops up. So what's the, what's the push? Is it just MIDI pads or knobs? Um, push is kind of if I could say it, put it simply, push is basically, if, if you had a mouse or a keyboard that was built to perfectly interface with Ableton, then that would be push. This is, I wouldn't say it's super easy to use without using a computer. I do it sometimes just to kind of get my mind in a different place, but, uh, everything like i've got i've got a pretty nice display screen here and the pads are basically acting as a piano roll um and the everything all the the factory stuff like uh operator and wavetable and impulse and oh, man i'm taking my i'm dating myself by using impulse um all the all the different uh the drum racks and whatnot it's all perfectly mapped to this so you don't have to map a, a midi controller to it or set any templates it just is kind of a plug and play so does anybody have any questions about anything that i just covered levi how are you doing No questions? Well, we'll keep this, um, we'll keep this pad open just in case. We'll see. Let's play around with this. No, uh, that's a good question, uh, uh, Noliak. So oscillators are not voices. Oscillators are the things that generate the actual tones in, the, in, the, in a synthesizer. And voices say how many different instances of that tone it can generate. So for example, like I'm going to play a chord on this synth. And that's three notes. Here you have um, the voices, it's set at 12. If I go to three, it's gonna sound the exact same because I'm only hitting three notes at the same time. Basically, if you have a monophonic synth, that means that it can only handle one note at a time. So if you play a chord on a monophonic synth, then it's just going to pick, it's going to prioritize a note. And you, in some of the synths have the ability to tell how it prioritizes the note, but nonetheless, it's only going to play one note at a time. So what you can do though on plugins is you can turn it into monophonic. I'm hitting three notes, but obviously just playing one of them. This becomes duophonic with two voices. And now we're at the three voices. Also, a little tip. If you're ever in a real pickle from a processor perspective and you just cannot free up processor space um, and your computer's overworking and it's buff doing all this weird buffering and glitching, what I recommend doing is going through your synths because, for example, this... Uh, this, this is a default instance of operator, and it starts out at six voices. So six voices means, what do I have? I have one note playing here. So check this out. If I go here, 
You've got this. Definitely not Mozart. If I go down here to four voices, it's going to sound the same. I go to three, sound the same. If I go to one, it sounds the same. And that is because I'm only playing one note. Okay. So this can actually save processor. And if uh, Wavetable, I think Wavetable opens up in Ableton default to eight voices. So that's a real doozy. Something else you can do, if you never want to have it open up with eight voices, you can simply right click on any of the devices and you can say, um, save as default preset. So for example, let's do an EQ8. If I do this here and I always have it set to, uh, you can have it set to oversampling mode, which will be a higher quality. Um, it's going to take more processor and all that. But let's say I always want it to be rolling off. I want to start it rolling off here. If I go right click here and then I save as default preset, now when... I bring that in, that's what it's gonna look like. But I'm gonna have it not set like that, so um, reset all gains, da, 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 da. okay. We don't need that. There we go. Let me just go here. All right. Um, now I'll save that back as a default preset. Yes, I want to overwrite it and you're, you're back up and running. Um, so that might be a good idea. If you're working on a computer that kind of has uh, weird hiccups and whatnot by it's just running a little slow, you might be able to stream streamline that and have it done equally. You could have your, your reverb, for example, always open up in high quality mode things like that. Any other questions? Noliak, that was a good question. Um, yeah, the oscillators. So you can have three oscillators, but only one, a monophonic synth, such as uh, Moog. Um, I think it's the Moog Slim. No. What's the, what's the kind of default Moog? Is it the sub 37, the one with the three oscillators? I don't know. I don't know my gear so well. I know like the Slim Fatty is a monophonic, um, but the one that the one that Monarch uh, from Native Instruments is emulating and all that, that's three oscillators and only one voice. It's all techno music. Chris, how you doing? All right, so if there's no questions, we'll move forward. Let's take this down to a minor. Model D, um, yes, yes, that's what I'm thinking of.
All right. So we we're actually kind of working through this through this pretty quick. Um, are there any questions about some of the basics? I don't I don't want to go through and explain every effect and every um, synth and everything because for me the most important thing is to get started and just start creating music, right? Just you want to be able to get some kind of result that you're at least somewhat happy with and then you can start diving back in. But in, in, this is the equivalent of like, just get the kids to play Mary Had a Little Lamb on the recorder. We've all done it, admit it. But Ableton, there's so, there's so much depth to it and so many different ways you can use it. I'm just giving you a, a really brief overview of the things that I think are the easiest tools to wrap your mind around. And then we can kind of dive in a little bit deeper after after we get to a place where we can create something basic so i've got some chords um i've got a drum got a bass line and i've got a little pad that's not doing much okay now what i'll just do is i'm gonna hit record and i'm gonna hit tab That'll be enough. Let's just drag this over. This was just something that I was showing you that you could do. Um, there's a question from Noliak. When starting a project, is there a better strategy between creating something very vanilla and then making it more complex or starting complex and making it simpler? No, I mean, I, I never, I tr well, I shouldn't say never, but there's different ways that I start tracks and it it changes depending on the mood depending on if if i start catching myself always creating something with like a drum machine at first then i'll try to make uh, a synth line or whatever because what what you create first in a track is often what you're gonna build it, and this is just the way my work, mine works, so it's not for everybody but i tend to build the elements around the first element that i create you know, and sometimes you, you create something from that, from that first building around that first element that ends up becoming the focal point. But a lot of times you start building. So if you start with the drums, you're going to build everything around the drums. And sometimes I don't want to have a track that's that the drums are the, are the fundamental point of the track. I think we've got a lot of, I, I love big boomy kicks. I'm not a hater, but sometimes it's nice to 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 challenge yourself to to make something be a different focal point for for a track versus the big boomy kick. So no, you can start out you can start out complex, um, and making make it simpler, or you can do whatever you want. the The only reason I'm gearing this towards complete beginners, and I don't want people to get to come in here and see this and get overwhelmed that's uh that's the that's my biggest goal i don't want anybody to leave these things saying maybe production isn't for me because it, music production's not really rocket science um once you once you get your mind around it you know, you learn keyboard shortcuts, you learn how to improve your workflow, you learn how to work faster. Um, a lot of music is, um, like I said, there's, there's symphonies and there's, you know, Mozart and crazy stuff like this and, and uh, drum rhythms that are from Neil Peart or something. But a lot of the music that we enjoy and consume, there's, there's not, 
something, some strange chord progression that's, that's out of this world. It's just really well put together. And, um, we don't, you don't need to make something super complicated for it to really move your soul, I guess. Yeah. Michael Gluckner starting out with the 808 kick. Michael, you know, I was just saying this today. I love 808s. I'm really not that good at mixing them. They're the most frustrating kick drum to mix. So I always, when I, when I load up an 808, I'm like, oh, it sounds so good. But I'm going to have to mix this down at some point. I'm like, do I, do I need to have it? Yes, I need to have an 808. All right. Looking forward to having it be a pain down the road. All right. So now we've, I just recorded these clips into arrangement view. That's not the only way you can do it. You can click on a clip in session view and you can just copy and paste. And that's, that's fine. Um, you can start out clips and you can start out. So if we, if we go here, we got the, um, drums, beats, loops, let's go to deep child. And I could take these, um, dub loops. I could just drag it in there and then you're ready to go. I can highlight here. If it's a MIDI track, I can highlight this can right click and insert uh insert midi clip there and then you can start composing right here so there's a lot of different ways so so don't look at this way as the way that you that you absolutely have to do it yeah dot initial so much better here on youtube hey i'm glad i i want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. And yeah, I'll do, I'm really open to different things that, that will, will just make it more accessible for people. That's all I'm concerned about, but thanks for the feedback. And I think you can watch YouTube. You can watch YouTube live without having a Google account or a YouTube account. Correct. I think so. Okay, if you notice here, all this stuff is kind of grayed out. That's because it's saying, ah, this person is playing clips in session view. And so these clips are going to override the clips in arrangement view. But if I turn this off, then it goes back to having, um, oh, the, I think my camera is in the way there. It's this right here. So if I do, hold on. It's this button right here. It was grayed out because I triggered the clips. Turn that off and now you're back in action here. If you play one clip, it's gonna gray that out because it's thinking that you wanna, you wanna preview something in session view and that takes precedence over um, the, what's in the arrangement view. Turn that off and you're good to go. Okay, no need for uh, accounts on YouTube. That's great. Great, great, great. All right. You can watch, but you can't troll without a YouTube account. All right. So now let's uh, cover... Let's start doing a little bit of uh, um, automation and showing how automation works. Uh, and if I'm going too fast, just tell me to slow down and I'll happily slow down. I, I really want to go the speed of the, the, the most fresh person in the room. So just keep me posted. All right. First thing I'm going to do, if you hit A, uh, that's... I've got my keyboard engaged, so if I hit A, then that disappears my automation lane. This was a this was a new feature, I think, in 10, Ableton 10, and I had to call up a few friends. I'm like, why, why is the automation window gone? I can't find my automation. And they're like, hit A. It was taunting you. Yeah. And then this pulls up the automation windows here. 
what are automation windows and automation lanes? Um, so pretty simple. You've got filter frequency on the operator here that we were messing around with. Um, let's see. Let's do something really obvious. Let's do reverb on the drum kit. So I've got mixer here. And then uh, reverb is, is in the automation lane. So let's do this. Yeah. 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 And it's only working if M isn't click. If, it, if you start to have M clicked, then um, you're going to start playing your keyboard. That's that's engaged your MIDI keyboard or your computer keyboard as a MIDI keyboard. So just hit M if it's not working. And that's probably what's happening. Um, yeah. So here's here's what we have going here. Let's look at the automation lane. I've got it all the I, I bring up the reverb on the return channel B or the sin B and I have it for four bars completely turned up and then four bars completely turned off and you'll see what it's doing here Right, not gonna not gonna put that to use, but I just wanted to show that as an example for for what you can do and how you can use the automation on that. Um, why automation? Um, basically, because you're gonna have things where whether it might be volume, where maybe this pad right here. Maybe I want this pad to not always be present. So I want it to kind of ride in and out. And here's something you can do. Uh, you can also take uh, command two makes the grid wider. So if you've got the pencil tool, then it's uh, making that as wide as you go. And if you go command one, it makes the grid smaller. But a lot of times what I'm doing is I take, I turn off the grid for drawing in volume automation so that it's not if i if i don't turn off the grid then what happens is is then it turns i i'm got it working and it's kind of blocky you know so i'll turn off the automation here or turn off the grid which is done with command 4 and i'll have this rise and fall and it'll give it a little bit of a human human feel whenever i turn off the grid Just remember, you might need to turn it on for something else. So now we've got this thing cre uh, crescendoing. And then if you wanna, if you wanna have it, the volume drop, like say here, we've got this crescendo happening. Let's turn the grid back on and then have it drop right there. And then bring it back up. Gets a little too loud there. And I'll just bring that first part down. And say say you um, want to you realize oh my gosh this the the automation is fine but 
the volume just gets too loud and I don't want to have to go back and rewrite all this, what you can do is you can highlight everything that you want to bring down the volume on. So highlight this whole, let's just do this whole thing right here. And then if you go underneath the automation lane, you'll notice it goes from red to blue right there. If you grab that, that's going to take the entire, um, the, the absolute or that would be the relative, uh, no, absolute volume. And you can bring it down or bring it up. So if you bring it down too far, it'll once it hits zero, it'll start squashing it all down. So then you have to be mindful of that because now when you squash it down, it's going to be stuck in that state. So I'll undo it. But I will bring it down just a little bit. And now let's see what we've got. And we don't need We don't need that little dumb riff at the end. Police sirens not included in this jam. Don't get your hopes up. So it just rises and falls with that automation. That's a good question. NDS, uh, NDS for, for years, for years, I use the utility module and that's a good point that I should bring up. Um, so the utility module, the nice thing about it is, is that you have, uh, if you use the utility module, then you have your volume faders free, right? And this is really nice for doing the final mix because you, you have the ability to control, you can do your utility module as your relative gains, and then you can have your volume faders as absolute gains. So for example, what um, NDS NDS is saying is if we use the utility module here, and let's just draw the... Let's just draw the automation lanes here. So, boom. Let's turn off the turn off the grid. Give it some better vibes. And then we'll drop that back down. Let's turn on the grid again and duplicate that. Now we've got Now we're doing the utility gain. Um, and I'll explain to you why I don't use it anymore and why I finally got uh, okay with using the volume faders. The reason I use the volume faders now is I got a I, I got motorized faders in my studio. And the motorized faders basically allowed me to automate uh, the the volume, the volume faders and create kind of that human feel with the volume and I never touch the volumes until the final mix because I was always using a a mouse and keyboard I never had I never had any kind of volume faders in there and uh then it changed so now actually NDS NDS I use the utility if I need to bring down the absolute volume then I'll bring in a utility plugin but then I'm using the volume for the kind of creative aspect of it so if you want to um, you've got the utility I'll keep the utility gain there we'll go to mixer and because we don't need both what you can do is click underneath that and go to clear envelope. So if you right click underneath the automation lane, clear envelope. 
Um, what do do I suggest? Main uh, do you mainly suggest utility? I would say if you're if you're using a keyboard and mouse, and you're not using the volume faders, if you're not jamming out in real time, so so I've got the the motorized faders because when I'm mixing, I want to be able to to hit the record and be able to grab faders and um, bring up the volume in real time and whatnot. But if you're using keyboard and mouse, I would I would go with what ND and, uh, NDS NDS said. Use use the utility. I mean, and you don't, to, to be honest, you don't even have to use the utility. Some of the, ah, yeah, they, the, the pesky gain on the EQ8, for example, is only going down 12 dB, but I don't have a, a set system. If you want to go down to absolute, then use the utility. But there's you can automate the gains and other things. What I would do though is don't automate the gains. If you if you're doing the gains on EQ8 to automate, that's fine. But make sure it's the last thing in the chain, whatever you're automating the gain on. Otherwise, so if for example, if you've got this and then you've got a compressor after that. If you automate the gain, the compressor is going to behave differently um, based on how how much volume is going into it, how much gain is going into it. So just be mindful of that. So how do you techno? You know, I've been trying to figure this out, Cedric. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. Trial and error. All right. So... Um, do I mainly, uh, mainly suggest utility, uh, keyboard and mouse producers? Yes. And there's nothing wrong with the keyboard and mouse producer. Um, I just, I just had gotten to a point where I was kind of lacking inspiration with, I wanted to, to be more focused on mixing, um, not DJ mixing, but actual mix down mixings. And I realized that, you know, you think about a console, it's designed that way for a reason. And what I did whenever I was a keyboard, just using keyboard and mouse settings, is if, if something wasn't mixing well together, the first thing that I would do, the first thing that I would do is grab an EQ. And I was always going to an EQ to fix, to fix my problems. That was my go-to. But if you think think about a console in the way it's laid out, um, the volume faders are closest to the user, right? And then you have a lot of times uh, pan, and then you've got EQ, right? So think about think about that as the as what you should reach for first when you're mixing. Reach for, reach for the volume fader first. And I, I'm telling you, once I got the faders in front of me, once I got the faders in front of me, I used the EQ a lot less. Because you, you actually don't always need to, to carve the life out of every sound in order to, to have things fit in the mix. A lot of times you're, you're fighting with, with the bass and the kick and you're EQing the daylights out of your bass line and you're notching out everything and you're doing everything. And sometimes if, if the stuff's in tune, you might just need to, to lower the volume on one or the other, right? You might not need the, the EQ as much as you thought it, as much as you thought you did. So at what point would you start to mess with automation? Um, whenever. I mean, sometimes sometimes I'll get a loop that's going in um, early on and I say, hey, we gotta start, we gotta start making this making this thing move right away. And and but it's a it's a case by case thing. You you have to kind of listen to where your inspiration is leading you and you have to know if you if you have the tendency to just noodle all day long on a loop and tweak every knob and whatever i would say start automating s soon you know start breathing some life into into the process pretty early on 
And now if you can make, then, then you're just trying to, to make things into, um, little bits. So, so, you know, make your, make your, make your eight bars interesting, then make 16 bars interesting, then make, you know, 32 bars interesting. And then once you, and then make those, those in the collection of interesting eight bar loops, make them fit in a, in a way that, that makes sense. Um, and that's it, right? So side chain compression, what about it? What about side chain compression? I use it all the time. Not in, not in like the EDM kind of way, but super useful. And, and you can, you can definitely use it in a non obvious way where it's not like, wow, 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 you know, but you can still make some nice creative rhythms with it. It's nice with ride symbols too. Clear up clashing elements. Um, yes and no. Like I mean, side chaining, side chaining the bass with the kick. Um, so what he, what Cedric is meaning for those who don't know. Let's go ahead and start this. Um, let's clear out everything except the bass and the kick. We'll start out with that. Dun dun dun. Delete that. We don't need that. Let's do that and here. Um, let's highlight this. Command L, loop it. Side chaining is a technique that you use where you're. Let me explain a compressor as as well as I can because I. When I first started producing, I heard people talk all the time, all the time about compression, 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 compression. And I never really knew what a compressor did. John Selway, how you doing? John Selway is a great educator with music stuff and he is doing Twitch streams. Go ahead and share the link, John. You do it every Saturday. Um, correct? Yeah, I think so. But so I was, I was always being talked. I was always like looking up to my idols and they would always talk about compression. And I thought, I don't know what compression does. The best way that I could describe, um, compression is think of it like a trash compactor. You know, if you've got those, if you've ever worked in a retail shop or something and they, and you have these, uh, the cardboard boxes that you throw in the bin and then eventually it makes this like Terminator sound and crushes it down. Um, and that's because, that's because when those boxes get above a certain height, it trips a sensor and it says, we gotta, we gotta compact these. Right. And so then it will take the 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 points and it's not a perfect analogy because you can set um you can basically exempt uh parts of the audio from being compressed and i'll get to that here in a second but uh basically once it gets above a certain threshold then you it's just going to squash it down yeah, more or less. A compressor is actually an automated volume controller. But it's doing... I would say it's doing a little bit more than that. Uh, so, so yeah. Yeah, it's, it's doing a little bit more than that. But, yeah, so here's what... This is really nice. In Ableton, the, the compressor actually shows a visual of what's happening so let's go to the operator here here's the waveforms 
if you um, bring down the threshold, that's when that's when the compressor starts happening. When you get it down below those peaks, right? You can see what it's doing. And then the ratio is how much, um, when, when it exceeds the threshold, when it exceeds the threshold, then it's going to, it's going to decide to what extent it actually squashes it down, right? So if you've got the ratio of four to one, then, uh, it will let me let me think uh, it says here uh, ratio of three means that for every three db of input above the threshold the output level will increase by one db okay so it's cr it's squashing it down at a three to one ratio so now you've got you've got the attack and the attack says when it goes above the threshold when it goes above the threshold then the attack decides when you start to squash it down. So on kick drums, for example, you don't want the, the kick drum to start being squashed immediately because that snap, that punch, that's the transient that you still want to have. So you don't want to lose that. You don't want to start squashing that down, right? Or it'll make it sound kind of muddy and whatnot. So what I would suggest doing for like a kick drum it's probably, I mean, play it, play with it by ear. And something that you can do to learn about compression is let's put this compressor on the, on the drums and just completely, completely throttle it. So bring the, th bring the threshold all the way down, bring the ratio all the way up, bring the attack down, bring the release up. So right now it's compressing so hard that there's there's nothing happening you can't hear anything that's bringing the ratio up let's bring let's bring keep the ratio at infinity and bring the attack up but we got to bring the release down otherwise it stays Do you, do you hear that? It's a, it's a little bit quiet. Because it's after 100 milliseconds, it's squashing it super hard. And then the release says how long you want that compression to, to remain for. Okay? But at the end of the day, you can read about compression. You can have somebody com explain it to you until you start playing around with it. And every compressor behaves differently. Every compressor, there's, there's some uh, compressors that, that are super kind of punchy in nature. There's some that, uh, that are completely the opposite. So play around with it and do, do really drastic movements on it to learn what each, each uh, parameter does with the plugin. Yeah. So there you go. And then bring the attack up. Now let's bring the ratio down. Let's bring the threshold back up. You hear how it's like super, super poppy and everything, everything else is kind of missing because you're, you're sucking out the low end because it's, it's getting squashed to all get out. And keep in mind, sometimes I'll be looking at someone's compressor and uh, they have the attack set right, theoretically, or there's not a right or wrong, but they've got it set within kind of what I would set it at for a specific sound. But then if you've got, for example, this, uh, the release is at um, 500 milliseconds here. And that means that it's never the the compressor is never disengaging because these kick drums are happening they're coming above the threshold 
faster than 500 milliseconds um, in a shorter time than 500 milliseconds. So that compressor never disengages. So you basically are just, it's, it's basically just the limiter, right? So bring that down. And you can, once you bring that release down, you can start hearing it breathe a little bit. But here's where, here's where I got really messed up with listening to my heroes that were always talking about. For example, they would always say a 909 with compression. 909 with compression oh, sounds great. You need to compress a 909. You need to compress it. And so every time I would pull up a 909 sample, I would say, right, Musical Heroes said you got to compress a 909. I've got a 909 kick here and I need to compress it because Steve Stoll said I need to compress it or because, you know, whoever said I needed to compress it. And what I didn't realize is they're talking about the drum machine. I'm not using the drum machine. I'm using samples of the 909. Nine times out of 10, the sample packs that you get are already compressed and processed. So this idea of thinking in absolutes of, okay, every time you hear a 909 kick drum, you need to reach for a compressor is just not true. You need to listen to your ears and know if it needs processing or if it doesn't sometimes kick drums don't need processing it depends on what kind of feel you're trying to make with it so yeah don't don't ever think in as i say don't ever think in absolutes um there's there's always flexibility and there's always exceptions to everything right so yeah but side chain compression, we're going to take this away from the kick and we're going to put it on the bass line. And what side chain compression does, instead of triggering with the, instead of having the threshold be tripped by something in the bass line, we're going to side chain it and we're going to have it be brought in from, let's do the bass drum. Jonathan, my pleasure. I do what I can. But no, I wouldn't say I, I actually, I enjoy teaching because I'm not that, I'm not the a studio guru by any means. And I would never present myself as that. Um, in fact, I was sometimes the person that my friends would get frustrated with because I would have to f ask so many questions about something to understand it. Um, that, yeah, so hopefully... I, it, that impacts the way I teach. And there, for me, there's nothing that, uh, that I know now that I didn't at one point have no clue about. Um, and there was a tweet that solved compression for me. It was from, uh, Rob acid, uh, Robert Babbitts, I think is how you say his actual name, but he made a tweet and this guy's a studio. He's brilliant in the studio. And he said, if you don't know what a compressor does, then why do you use it? That's it. You don't have to use something that you don't know what it does. And that's completely fine. There are other workarounds to do. And with regards to ND and, uh, NDS, there are actually things that you could do as workarounds for this in uh, in the digital world where you can, for example, automate volume in here. And let's go here. Why can I not find that? So envelopes, operator, let's do, yeah, let's do the operator volume. You could, instead of using, comp oh, that's super loud. Instead of having it duck around the kick with the compressor, you could actually carve out the audio here in, um, in the clip mode. So here's what you're seeing in the clip. If you click on this middle thing right here, then you have these envelopes and you can automate 
you can automate in um, arrangement view, but you can also automate the individual clip. So there's there's different different uses for and different advantages to doing both. But yeah. Now if I solo that. So I've, I'm ducking the volume there. And that's one thing we do. We'll keep it. We'll keep the volume up though. And then we can put this compressor in here. And on the, I'm, I'm side chaining it to the 909 core kit, but then I've got all these different options. For sake of what we're doing, it's not super important. We're just trying to get something to duck it. So and when I'm doing the bass line, I want to set I want to set the attack to a absolute uh, zero or as close to zero as you can on whatever compressor you're using. So I've got that here, and I'll set the ratio to like uh, five, five to one. But the reason I have the attack all the way down and have a, as short as possible is because I want to carve out, I want the compressor to carve out space for the kick drum to punch through, okay? And that's going to be, so I want, the, I want the compressor to engage immediately. Something else that you might notice if you're using this is, I don't know if it still does this in 11. Let's see. If you're on peak, it will make kind of a, a clicky sound. Switch it to RMS and that, that resolves a lot of the clickiness. And then you can play around with the, the release for where you want the, the bounce to happen. So see if you can hear the difference. Really steady, no real bounce to it or anything. And that's a little bit drastic, but when you've got, when you've got the uh, kick drum running with it, you, you don't really notice. Okay. Um, any questions about any questions about sidechain compression, compression, anything like this? Nothing. Cool. All right. So another thing that you can do if if you ever have a baseline, for example that is just really causing a lot of frustration with, with your drum loop, something that you can do is you can do a little bit of offsetting with, uh, let's just shorten this loop here. You can actually take these notes, the notes that are hitting right on the kick. Don't be afraid to take that and just move it slightly off the, I'm gonna shorten this. Let's loop it um, right here. And then take that there, let's go here. So let's loop this. And what you can do, you're not gonna notice, you're not gonna notice bringing this baseline off slightly from from the grid of where the kick sits and once you start noticing then it's time to reel it back in but let's bring this out ok 
Okay, now now you're obviously getting out of hand here. But even for for this sound, you you can't always get away with uh, cheating this much. But um, you've created a lot of space where there is no bass hitting there on the kick. You freed up a lot of stuff, and the the feeling is still perfectly there. That's it, right? So, just little tricks like that, uh, creating space for every sound that you have, uh, that'll, that'll go a long way with all this. So, no questions about this? No questions? All right. Oh man, it's super dark. There we go. How long have I been grayed out for? And then you can just start getting creative with the with the arrangement. Start uh, bringing in different things at different times. I'll just copy and paste this here. You can start moving stuff around. You can highlight stuff. This is uh, something that I'm using all the time. If I if I highlight all this um, from uh, the 33 mark to the 41, and if I just hit uh, Shift Command X, it actually deletes the time, and it it cuts uh it cuts the time and the actual all the contents within it and now you've got it pasted to the clipboard so i could go back here and i could put it there um yeah and if you ever have a track that's getting a little bit boring then there's your there's your uh resolution for it Sorry if the topic was a bit more advanced. No, it wasn't too advanced. Um, I, I think if nothing else, people, people are going to hear about compression and um, they need to know the basics of compression and they also need to know um, that you don't have to use it on the typical applications of compression, you know? A lot of times I would, when I, when I first started using compression, I would make everything sound worse with compression, compression, but I kept telling myself I need to use compression. And you say, why would I use this if it's making it sound worse? And there's so many tools that you can use to accomplish a similar result that, um, you, you don't necessarily need, um, these these tools that you absolutely needed many years ago because you couldn't go in with a with a mouse and carve out space and and re redraw waveforms even in pro tools for example so yeah it's not complicated at all um let me let me go ahead um where do you use parallel compression Sometimes I'll run parallel compression. Um, I'll set up. I'll set up a send. I mean, this is getting pretty complicated, but I'll set up a send or a return track, 
and I'll use that as kind of my dry wet with the with the parallel compression. Um, if I if I want to make it use uh, be be chunkier or whatever, um, but. I also always say that the, the, the best way to, to get a, a chunky feel for a track is to use chunky source material, um, whether that's creating your own, whether that's using good samples um, and not having to you know, swim upstream whenever you're, if you're using bad source material, it's going to be really hard to go back and retroactively correct all that stuff. So parallel compression is cool. I'm not, I'm not that great at it. Um, but when it's done right, when it's done right, it's incredible. So yeah. And you can def that's definitely, uh, way past the, uh, the beginner's tutorial, um, settings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this. I think we've covered enough, enough material here. So save live set as beginners workshop 2.2. Two. Let's do that. And then I'm going to share this, uh, this folder in, in the chat once again. And again, these are these are using all samples that are available on my link tree and available within Ableton's stock samples. So everything is stock here. So you'll be able to, I'll copy this link, can pull it up, and there you should have it. I'll stick around for a little bit and answer any questions that, that people might have. But uh, yeah, if, if nothing else, then join us on Twitch tonight. Not entirely sure what we'll be doing. We'll be hanging out. I'll probably be working on some music, talking some trash, the usual. But any questions that anybody would have, I would happily, happily answer them to the best of my ability. My pleasure, Jonathan, Andy. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, I've got to say, I like the YouTube format way better than uh, Facebook. I'm digging it. I'm digging it. This is my first actual stream of sorts on YouTube. So... Let's see. And if you want to support, this is so YouTube-y of me, but you can subscribe to the channel. It costs you nothing, but it allows you to get notifications and all that jazz. And, and I think I become, I, I become better potential to not be friend-zoned by YouTube. So, yeah, it'll be up there. Don't forget to give this an upvote. Smash that subscribe button, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, all that stuff. And I will see you here in a little while on Twitch. We'll be at around 9.30 or 10, depending on how much time I need away from the camera. So thank you all for being here. We will see you soon. And we're going to be doing this. Um, we're going to be doing this. Uh, Tomorrow or next week, uh, Tuesday, 7 p.m. Central European time. So as long as there's um, interest, I'll, I'll do it for, for a good chunk of time, maybe like one or two months. So hit that bell. <laughs> Y'all are funny. All right. We'll see you on Twitch here.